Thank you. Um, th and Mr. Secretary, I appreciate many of the sentiments that you've expressed today, but I'm, I want to go back to the memo. Uh, and I know that you and I have talked about it, and I heard your response to the chairman. But um, we debated these policies uh, in this committee. We debated them with the House and the Senate as each chamber uh, developed its respective proposals to reauthorize these federal surface transportation programs. These policies were um, ultimately rejected and not included in the final legislation sent to the president's desk. So let me give you a specific example, and I believe you have it there because there's no way you could read it from there. Appreciate it. Um, House Chairman Peter DeFazio's Invest in America Act included language that restricted the ability of a state to carry out a project that added new capacity for single occupancy passenger vehicles. His language is shown on um, this one over here. You can see it's, it's got some highlighted areas. The FHWA memo directs FHWA staff to encourage state departments of transportation and other entities to consider certain factors before advancing projects that result in new capacity for single occupancy vehicles. The language from this memo is shown and this other poster here. As you can see, this language from the memo is lifted from the bill that DeFazio had, uh, that was sent over here to the Senate as the shell bill that we rejected here in the United States Senate. The Surface Transportation Reauthorization Act, which passed this committee, had no such language in there. I've said many times this is a bipartisan bill, it's a product of careful negotiations that reflected the will of the committee unanimously. You sent me a letter earlier that said, uh, in response to what, my, what bringing me this to your attention, and you, your memorandum said that it's consistent with the bipartisan infrastructure language, and I just don't think it's consistent, and I'm really troubled that a memo coming from your department has language in it that was rejected from the House bill basically verbatim. So I guess, what's your reaction to that? So I guess I would say my understanding is what was rejected was the mandate with regard to these goals, not the idea of these goals. So, so as I look down the text, for example, the first one I see is progress in achieving a state of good repair consistent with the state's asset management plan. Now, I cannot imagine that anyone here rejects the proposition that it's a good thing to have progress in achieving a state of good repair consistent with the state's asset management plan. What I do recognize is that there was a move in the House to say that unless you'd shown that progress, you couldn't even go forward on some of that new construction. And if that were to have prevailed, then of course my department would be responsible for implementing that law. But that's not what the law says that, that you passed, of course. Uh, the law does not say that you have to prove that you've made that progress on a state of good repair in order to do anything else. B but I would be perplexed by any suggestion that we should no longer believe that a state of good repair is a good thing. If I were to go to the next bullet, and I, I think that the, I'm just seeing this here, but I think it's the same that's on the board, and I appreciate you providing it for me because it is a bit of an eye chart from where I sit. Uh, there's a reference to how the project will support the achievement of the state's performance targets. So again, I, 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 as I understand the progress of the bill, uh, the Senate did not go forward with a requirement saying the state has to meet its performance targets in order to be allowed to do new construction. And so as we go forward implementing the law, we would not impose any such mandate. But of course, we still believe it's a good thing for a state to uh, achieve its, its performance targets. If I go to the third one, it, it says whether the project is more cost effective than both operational improvements to the facility or corridor and transit projects eligible under Chapter 53, Title 49. So my understanding is, had the House bill passed, we would have been required under the law to certify that in some way uh, in order to allow that funding to go forward. But of course, that's not what passed, as, as you point out. And so there is no such requirement. Um, but of course, cost effectiveness continues to be something that, that we would consider to be important and would support states in achieving. Uh, so to me, the, the difference, of course, is, is that mandate. And my understanding is, and, and our understanding as we go forward, implementing the law as written, is it has no such mandate. And that's why the memo says that there's no such requirement. 
So from your explanation, would, would, it, would, would I assume that the fact that they're verbatim from the DeFazio bill into the memo that came from your department, word for word, is just because, because? Well, it's because they're good ideas. It's just that the law doesn't mandate them, so neither will we. So are you in the habit of lifting language from unpassed bills and putting it into regulations that you put in forward that obviously had been negotiated out of bills? Well, again, our understanding was that what was negotiated out was not the idea of cost effectiveness, but, but the mandate. So as we seek to implement the bill as written, you'll continue to see phrases like state of good repair that I trust have been on the lips of secretaries, Republican and Democrat alike, and members of both parties in both chambers. Thank you. But the law as written does not provide for us to require it, and so, so we won't. Okay, so I, I think in, 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 in you referenced the letter uh, uh, from Ashto, the uh, uh, state highway administrators, who also wrote you a letter uh, expressing concerns, along with governors uh, and many states. And in that, you pick out a sentence that says that they very much share uh, the policy priorities outlined in the guidance. But the four-page letter is basically saying, yes, these things are important. These things are things that we as states formulate. It's different for Maryland than it is for me or Delaware or, or North Dakota. So let us keep the flexibility mm -hmm. of moving forward on safety and repair. This is what state DOTs do. They keep their roads as much as they can in good state repair. That, that's, that's what they're doing now and have done. Mm -hmm. But now we have an opportunity with a bipartisan infrastructure package to really build more where areas that need that. And in your memo, you say you, more capacity, but there's a big but in there. You have to consider all these other things. You should consider all these other things. If you look further into the Ashto letter, since you brought it up, some of the quotes are, while the legislative process that led to the IIJA was certainly unconventional, and the congressional intent regarding the federal highway program over the next five year provides state DOTs with flexibility in how investment decisions are made with formula to meet the, each state's unique mobility and accessibility needs, proposals to require fix-it-first solutions or prescribe the use of certain sources of funding for system preservation do not reflect the use of strategic planning but rather a one-size-fits-all approach to asset management. So this is part of the letter that you're quoting from as well as they deviate from what they see is a, um, a directive from the department to do it one way, this way, uh, if you want to have favorable or at least move higher up into the priorities. So what, what, what kind of reaction would you have to that? Well, I, I think that the, the states are rightly saying that they share these same goals that we're talking about, uh, the kinds of goals reflected in these bullets, for example, but they want the flexibility to be able to do it based on their strategy, based on their approach, and, and based on their needs. And we support that flexibility. Uh, in implementing the law as written, uh, we are to provide the flexibility that's written into the law, and of course the accountability that's written into the law for, for the uh, standards that apply to the use of federal taxpayer dollars. Uh, and, and that's what we will seek to do. Yeah, um, and I would say there's confusion here. There's confusion from the, uh, the stakeholders. There's confusion from the state DOTs because they said, uh, they are expressing concern in, in the letter they said back to you. I'm gonna move on to one more thing before I give up my questioning. I think I'm over my time. Maybe I should wait uh, and let the others members question. I wanted to ask about the one federal decision. Sure. Um, quickly, I want to know, uh, how are you implementing this? What steps have been taken? Uh, what kind of uh, uh, conversations are you having between all the different agencies? So I'll give you the most compact answer that I can, which is that uh, we're working hard to, to implement that, in particular noting the expectation of uh, steps consistent with the two-year agency average in, in clearing those uh, projects that, that are major, that have that environmental uh, impact statement attached to them. Uh, we'd be happy to follow up about uh, uh, with more detail on the progress, but uh, we take Do that. Do you have a timeline for implementing this? Uh, well, you know, it's already uh, uh, now, we work toward that goal right now. Uh, in terms of when we'll be able to have sort of the dashboard up, 
uh, and see how we're tracking toward that goal. I hope to be making progress right away. Okay, thank you. I mean, thank you, Mr. Secretary. And I also want to thank you personally for the, the personal outreach that, that you have extended to me and to my staff numerous times and shared your cell phone and all of that. Your accessibility is really remarkable, and I really appreciate that, that as we move through the implementation. That will be very important. Um, I do want to add uh, to the record, uh, unanimous consent, uh, these are documents that show the questions, uh, letters from different states and other stakeholders and from lawmakers questioning the, the guidance document. That Without objection. Did. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to that one more time. Uh, and, and I want to ask you a question. Have you had any conversations with Mr. Landrew, who is charged by the president to implement uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill on this topic that we've talked about, the guidance issue. Uh, I remember him mentioning that uh, that he got some calls about it around the time that it came up, but uh, uh, we haven't talked through the substance of the memo in detail. Well, I, I would suggest that you re that, that you have another conversation. He, we, I was in a meeting last week with him with numerous lawmakers to where this issue was uh, was discussed briskly. <laughs> I will say. And and uh, and so I would suggest that that is uh, he's hearing from a lot of different people that I, I'm sure you're hearing from, but he might be hearing it from a little bit different angle. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so on that last topic, I would say in in response to the question that um, Senator Kelly asked, use and this was around the mega projects, but I would imagine that this is all guidance. Your quote was, uh, and I just wrote it down: guidance uh, lays out basic expectations, and I think that's where the issue is with this December uh, 16th guidance letter. The other thing I'd like to say is in terms of what uh, Senator Whitehouse said and some of the comments that you have said, you know, this is a bipartisan bill that we passed. There is a climate title in there. There is an emphasis on uh, finding resiliency, greenhouse gas mitigation, uh, carbon emissions, healthy streets. This is an area that we are deeply committed to. Uh, these are grant programs. These are not the formula dollars that go out. So I want to make the distinction, and would you agree, these are two separate programs or pots of money, so to speak. So um, the, the discussion that I'm having you uh, with you on this guide doesn't really apply to the climate title parts of the bill. Would you say that's correct? Uh, I think, yeah, I, I think most of what we've been discussing in that context was outside federal highway, uh, federal aid highway programs. Yeah. Right, yes, thank you, thank you. Um, Okay, a question on the, uh, you put out a uh, 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 combined notice of funding for three different programs, the MEGA, the EMFRA, and uh, the Rural Surface Transportation Grant Program, which obviously is one that I'm uh, most interested in, or not most interested in, but very interested in. Mm -hmm. And I, my understanding is that this is sort of an unusual approach. I, I, I'm not sure how to really calculate. I, I guess I'd like to know why you're doing this and then the, the education and uh, outreach that you've done to the states because this is a, di a different way of looking at this. Yes, thanks for asking that. What, what we're trying to do is make our grant process more simplified and user-friendly, less duplicative, uh, especially knowing that the, the easier we can make our processes to navigate, the more we're going to see uh, rural communities, communities with uh, fewer resources, able to take advantage of it. Uh, our staff likens it to a common application for college, so you don't have to put in your zip code uh, nine different times. Of course, uh, there's information that, that sometimes is very customized to these specialized programs, but if we can gather it up all at once and only ask you to fill one form instead of three, we think it's one example of reducing the administrative burden associated with what can already be a daunting set of requirements to, uh, to try to apply for these programs. Well, good, because, I mean, that's sort of the way I saw it. I, I, I thought, well, it's a, a trying to be a simplification, I guess, the, the devil's in the details to see how, uh, how that actually rolls out. I don't think bureaucracy in any place is known for simplification or, or, or anything. So I hope, I hope that that is the end result, because if, if you're looking at opening up these applications to different, not just state DOTs, but municipalities, and where they don't have the, our, our state DOT basically helps all our municipalities write all of their um, uh, grant applications that they can have right now anyway in this area. So thank you for that. Um, on the EV, just a quick question. I might, I might be off base here, uh, not understanding it. So the money goes, you've already put the guidance out, and I think you said $6 billion, and the five. state's, five, and the state's going to 
um, build and maybe get contractors to build uh, the EV stations in public areas, I guess. Uh, the question that came to me was, once that's completed, the ownership and maintenance and liabilities of those facilities then goes to... So we don't generally view these as uh, government-owned and operated, and certainly not federal government-owned and operated charging stations. But part of what I hope will come of the flexibility for the states to come in with their plans is different approaches. Notably, the law provides for uh, maintenance to be one uh, spend, uh, one eligible use of the funding, uh, and capital to be another. And we may, we certainly won't have all of the answers here in Washington on which is the more efficient way to set up a public-private partnership. In other words, which piece of it being subsidized will prove to be the most efficient. Uh, so I think it's a great example of a laboratory of ideas where different states working with different private partners will come up with different models to uh, effectively buy down the difference of the cost in getting those EV chargers up and running uh, so that they can make for that national network. So then you would anticipate that that issue of maintenance and liability and other issue would be worked out on the front end rather than, oh, now we have this, who's going to take care of it? Yes, Is that I think that's that's right. Those are the kinds of things we're working through with the joint okay. office right now, and we'd be happy to uh, keep you apprised. Yeah, as, as that, that, that's a question that, uh, that that came to me. And and then this is kind of a question out of left field, but um, I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, you know, the president gave his State of the Union address last night. He started with Ukraine. Obviously, thank you for your service. You know uh, what's in the hearts and minds of our military is they're sort of on tenuous ground right now in terms of families being deployed to the NATO nations. Uh, have you had any conversations or have any conversations occurred with you and your department as to what role you might play in terms of ratcheting down any involvement we have with Russian-made goods, Russian commerce, uh, Russian contractors? I mean, is this something that's into your realm or not? Uh, to some extent, yes, and this was a theme of a conversation I had uh, late yesterday afternoon with uh, my counterpart, the uh, Ukrainian Minister of Infrastructure, as well as their, their ambassador in Washington. Uh, and one of the things we discussed was something that uh, they requested that, uh, that the president then announced last night, which was the, uh, the closure of the U.S. airspace to right. Russian aircraft. There may be other steps that uh, would be appropriate that are within our authorities. Obviously, we're, this uh, uh, has, situation is fast unfolding, uh, and so we're, we're moving quickly to assess them. Um, but I do think there are a number of things uh, with regard to infrastructure and certainly with regard to travel that we need to look at uh, as a way to make good on our commitment to support the Ukrainian people. And I'm also in frequent contact with uh, many of my counterparts among our allies and partners to uh, look at what they're doing, what we might be doing, and, and how best to coordinate. Well, I, yeah, I'd like to follow up on that as time goes on, because I think um, we certainly don't want to uh, get into a situation where we find out, as we, I think, have been enlightened to, that we've been importing 600 thousand barrels of oil from Russia, that our transportation system is wholly reliable, obviously not wholly reliable, partly reliable, or certain parts or certain minerals or whatever is relying on the Russian economy because what we see going on, I think we all agree here, is egregious uh, in terms of Russia's um, aggression. Mm -hmm. and, and we want to shut that down as quickly as we can. So thank you so much for that.